participant across the globe. We welcome you to the ESPS case webinar organized by Ford School of Management, New Delhi and Amaral India. The webinar topic is how to write an impactful case study. We have with us our guest speaker, Professor Michael M. Goldman. Mr. Michael M. Goldman is an award-winning marketing and sales teacher, researcher, and advisor to organizations in several countries. He is a chief editor of the Emerging Market Case Studies collection by Emerald Publishing. Professor Goldman is based in California as a professor in the University of San Francisco Sports Management Master's Program and is on the executive board of the North American Case Research Association. We welcome you, sir. We have with us Mr. Sundar Radhakrishnan. Mr. Sundar Radhakrishnan is a managing director at Emerald India and has been associated with the company for more than eight years. He has held various management roles with Springer Nature, Cambridge Assessment English, Times Group, Monster.com, and McGraw-Hill Publications. Welcome, you, sir. We have with us uh, Ms. Sangeeta Menon, Publishing Relationship Manager at Emerald Publishing. We welcome you, ma'am. We have with us Ms. Melissa Close. Cases Commissioning Lead at Amrill Publishing, based in Boston in the United States. We welcome you, Ms. Malisa. And we have with us Dr. Jitend K. Das, Director for School of Management, New Delhi, India. Dr. Das has, a prof uh, has been a professor of marketing and the founder Dean Noida Campbell of the IIM Lucknow. With a BTEC and AMTEC both from the IIT Delhi and a doctorate from the University of Toronto, he has to his credit many national and international publications. He has been a consultant to many national and international organizations such as Coal India, World Bank and IDRC Canada. We welcome you, sir. Also, we have with us our Dean, Professor Himarshu Joshi, Dean Academic Services, Professor Rajni Chauhan, Dean Corporate Relations and Professor Sangmistra Bhutatriya, Dean Academic with us. Welcome you, sir and ma'am. Uh, we would like to invite Dr. Jitendra K. Das, Director of Coal School of Management, New Delhi, to address the first session. Over to you, Dr. Das. Sir, you're, sir, you're on, uh, on mute. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Ashtos uh, Pandey. Uh, the number of uh, registrations in this program is uh, testimonial to the effort. Uh, or rather joint effort of uh, Professor Ashutosh on our behalf and uh, um, uh, Ms. Sangeeta from uh, uh, Emerald. Um, I take this opportunity to thank profusely uh, Professor uh, uh, Michael Goldman who's uh, agreed to do this uh, uh, about an hour and a half, 15 minutes, uh, uh, 75 minutes of uh, 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 taking sessions on how to write cases or how to handle cases. Uh, a case writing for a B school is really very important uh, and uh, I'm sure uh, as has been just shared uh, Professor Michael was saying half of India has signed up or half of Indian academics have signed up that's very heartening uh, uh, information. Uh, case writing is very important especially because of the, uh, the new economic uh, change that is happening the world over. So all the traditional cases that we have had uh, in the past needs to be uh, re-looked at uh, from the learning as well as from the teaching purpose. And then the cases which have to be written in the new context uh, have to be done with uh, uh, you know, proper understanding of what is the purpose of the case and you know, uh, how to go about writing a case, particularly the teaching note. The teaching note is really a very crucial aspect of uh, a case uh, writing. And uh, I'm sure uh, the, the session taken by uh, Professor Goldman would be a great uh, learning experience for all the participants uh, who are with us uh, in this uh, evening, in this uh, webinar. Uh, we are also thankful to uh, uh, Emerald, uh, particularly Ms. Sangeeta Menon, who has been uh, uh, with us on this particular uh, event. Uh, and a lot of hard work has gone into organizing this event. And uh, I was just told by Professor Astosh and uh, Professor Gordon himself that uh, roughly 1,200 participants have uh, signed up from five continents of the world. And I think there are only five continents in the world. So all the continents are getting represented. And um, approximately uh, 17 countries uh, are uh, being reflected uh, through these uh, participants who are going to spend 
an hour and 15 minutes uh, listening to uh, Professor Michael uh, Goldman. And this is really very important uh, aspect of a business school uh, professor. So I'm sure uh, uh, the time that they'll be spending today would be worthwhile. And uh, we hope to do many more similar webinars and uh, uh, seminars and activities with uh, uh, Professor uh, Michael Goldman as well as with uh, uh, Imran in, in times to come. Uh, this would also give us a lot of uh, learning experience as organizers as to how to go about doing things such that the purpose of such webinars are fulfilled and the participants really feel very happy uh, end of the um, webinar. So with these words, I thank you all uh, for joining us and uh, for uh, being a panel member in this uh, evening's uh, session. And thank you once again. Thank you. Uh, over to Professor Ashutosh. Thank you, sir. So now I would, I would like to invite Professor Michael M. Goodman to start the case discussion. Over to you, Professor Michael. Well, thank you, Ashutosh and, and Dr. Das. Thank you for uh, those uh, kind of introductory comments about a, a topic that I know is, is really interesting for everyone, as we saw with the registrations for today. Um, I'm delighted that uh, so many people are able to spend some of their evening with us uh, to explore this, uh, this critical question for us as scholars, uh, as those interested in studying the business. Uh, and, and thinking about industry and the economy. So, as mentioned, I'm Michael Goldman. I greet you from California uh, this evening, and I'm delighted to spend some time exploring this topic. Uh, what I'd like to do uh, this evening is really talk about three topics that I hope would be of useful to you. Uh, the chat is open, so please pop any questions that you may have as we go through the conversation. Please send those through to the chat so that I can integrate your questions and answer any specific um, queries you may have as we go through the conversation uh, around why we want to go and focus on case studies. What really is a discussion based case? How is it different? What is the specific what are the specific criteria that go into a quality case and how do we go about doing uh, the case study? Certainly, there are many days and hours and months that have been written and said and done on case research. And so what we'll try and do in our time together this evening um, is, is really focus on some of the key aspects as you get going on your journey of doing case research. Um, and we'll talk about some resources that are available to you uh, within the Emerald context, but also beyond some resources that are available to you to continue your learning as you develop your case writing, especially, but also case teaching skills. We really talk about the case method. All right, so I'm gonna dive into that and, and shout on the chat if there are any questions as we go along. The first focus I, I want us to have is this question of why. Why do it? Dr. Das suggested that case studies are really important for business schools. That in business school environments, it's important to do cases, to have cases, to teach cases, to write cases. What I want to challenge us to think about around that question is our individual why. Why do we do what we do? And for many academics, for many scholars, um, there are a set of things we have to do. We join a business school, we join a university after completing some studies, masters or doctoral level studies. And then we're told we have to publish. Publish or perish is sometimes what they say. And so we have this perception that we, we have to do this, right? But we may not be connecting with why we want to do this. For many of us, we entered this profession for a range of different reasons. Some of us were really interested in one interesting topic and we wanted to deep dive into that specific question. And that explodes into a range of interesting studies and readings and writings for most of our career. For others amongst us, it might be our time with students and teaching and education and empowering the next generation of leaders. That might be what attracted us to this profession. 
What I want to challenge you to think about as we start this evening is the kind of real impact that you want to make. What kind of impact do you want to make as a scholar, as an academic, beyond the number of publications? And there's been a movement emerging over the last few decades around this idea of real impact around this idea of going beyond citations, going beyond numbers, going beyond where a certain piece of work happened to be published and, and who thinks what of it. Much more to what impact does that work have on the audience that matters to us. So this movement of real impact, and you can see comments by the AACSB and Emerald and a number of journals and a number of, of academic associations have all been thinking about how do we help academics and scholars connect with some, some impact that goes beyond the numbers. One of the implications here uh, potentially is that your publication is only the first step. So it's not the end of the story. It's not the outcome that we aim for. It's just an enabler to a bigger, more important outcome. For example, as Dr. Singh says in the chat, what are some of those real bigger issues that we want students to engage with? We may, as, as colleagues in a teaching environment or scholars researching a topic, we may want students to change the world Right? We hear that phrase really often. We may want students to transform societies or transform economies. Uh, and, and so that's a really important impact we want to make. How do we go about doing that? Part of what this movement over the last few years and decades has pushed towards is that it's more than just one kind of publication that we should be doing. And it's more than just having the publication. It's about what we do with it. So certainly as we get going here today, I want to challenge you to connect with your why. Think about why you're doing academics. Why are you a scholar? Why are you a professor? Uh, what do you want to have achieved? What is some of that bigger outcome? And then obviously my question is going to be, how does your publishing, how does your writing, how does your research connect with that? And how do we go beyond uh, a specific uh, an article here or an article there uh, and we hit some numbers and we get some lines on our resume or our CV and we keep the dean happy? Well, that, that's fine, but that's only a step towards a bigger outcome. And how can we make sure our work connects with that? So we can see the thoughts coming through in the chat. Right, thinking about how do we use our research for future engagements, for other work with students, for other works with other stakeholders, which is really where I want to challenge us to think about. Here's an example that may be instructive for you. Uh, Michael Porter, many of you know and, and have worked through many of his frameworks. Think about the five forces, think about the diamond model, think about microeconomics of competitiveness. Michael Porter certainly has had a substantial impact on how many organizations do what they do, on how many countries and economies do what they do. I think about the Chilean wine cluster. I think about uh, the, the government of Singapore's economic strategy, right? I think about from the smallest organization to some of the biggest organizations, Michael Porter's thinking and Michael Porter's work has certainly had a substantial impact. Well, here are some of the comments from Michael Porter that he made at a recent NACRA conference, the North American Case Research Association. And he came through and he spoke to a room full of case uh, researchers and, and case authors, and he said this. So as you read that quotation, which you may have on your screen in front of you from my slide, what jumps out for you? What strikes you? What hits you from this quotation from Michael Porter? Let's get some thoughts in the chat here. What do you find most interesting about Michael Porter's comments in this quotation? 
Aditya, I'm sorry you can't see it. Uh, let's see, some other thoughts come through here. Anybody that can see the slide, what's, uh, what's interesting for you about uh, his comments? Mohammed Rashid Faridi talking about a holistic approach, right? Uh, Rupansoni talking about research as a never ending process, marrying theory and practice, Rajendra Sharma. So what you can see here is Michael Porter talking about the impact he had. What did it come from, right? It came from not just looking at data objectively, scientifically, hidden away in a building somewhere on the Harvard campus, uh, separated from reality, right? Uh, he recognizes in his own work a combination, right? A balance, as many of you saying, uh, Madhumita Das talking about the balance, right? In research approaches. And so Michael Porter here in his, in his reflections is, is talking about the balance between different kinds of research and different kinds of work that allows a more complete, a more holistic picture of the phenomenon. Right. If I'm studying a phenomenon like this cap right of my water bottle, if I'm studying this phenomenon. If I look at it just from one angle, I'm only getting one perspective of that phenomenon. But if I look at the cap from many different angles, using many different tools and methods, I'm going to get a much more complete, perhaps a more accurate right, perception of the phenomenon of the object, whether I'm studying um, you know, leadership dynamics within an organization or startup economic principles for a business or social media marketing in sport. Whatever my phenomenon is that I'm studying, I want to attack it from multiple angles. So, so here's Michael Porter reflecting on his own work and the importance of case studies, especially longitudinal in-depth case studies that, that really help understand the why um, of decision making. When we look sometimes at just the numbers and we look at secondary source data, um, what we're getting is um, you know, some of the numbers, some of the observations of what happened in the end. What may be unclear is why people did that. So to sit across the table and understand from the decision makers exactly why they think they did that and how they did it and what were the influences and issues that's an important part of getting a bigger picture greg fisher here who did his mba with me in south africa he's a professor in indiana here in the us and he's the editor of business horizons a, a um, journal that, that a number of you may be reading and, and publishing in and he made an a, a editorial comment recently about the need to publish where our target audience is. His argument is that unfortunately, many of the places we publish, the journals that we publish to, we're talking to each other. We're talking to fellow academics, right? We're talking to the scientific community. And that's an important uh, stakeholder group. That's an important audience, but it's not perhaps the complete audience if we're studying business. And Greg Fisher's argument here that I want to challenge you to think about is if we are studying business, if we want to have an impact on business, we need to perhaps be talking to business through our work as well. Uh, and so publishing in ways that reach business, business students, business managers, business executives, is one way to have that conversation with a stakeholder. So we go beyond doing work in isolation and publishing it partly in isolation in journals that talk to academic communities. That's fine, but that's only one community, right? And we want to think about how we reach multiple, multiple communities. All right. So you can see here that it's about having a portfolio. Uh, Sher Singh Yadav asked a question in the chat about 
writing practitioner focused papers and then getting uh, rejected in certain places. And that's really important in understanding who you're writing for and the publication, the appropriateness for the publication. Appropriateness is really important that we marry uh, who we're writing for, where we're writing and how we're writing. So if I'm looking to write to, with, to my academic colleagues, I'm going to write in a certain style. I'm going to um, put, put a specific structure together. I'm going to publish it in a certain place and in a certain way, right? And that's part of my portfolio of intellectual contribution. But if I would like chief executives to be influenced by my thinking, by my work, by my findings, well, I, I recognize that 99% perhaps of chief executives, uh, bless their hearts, they are not reading the academic journals that we publish in. So I need to write in a different place. I need to write in a different way. Think about students. Some of us are able to integrate uh, our research work that we publish in journal articles. We're able to integrate that into our classroom and that's great. But let's be honest, most of our students are really struggle to get their heads around our academic articles and they're not finding them useful because to be honest, we're not writing for our students. We're not writing in an accessible way for students to learn when we're writing in an academic um, journal article. So understand the audience, understand the right kind of publication, the right place, and understand the right way, right? The method, uh, the, the way of communicating has to be appropriate. We have to put those together. And that's where I think case studies can make such a useful contribution. As many of you said in the chat already this evening, case studies can be that connection point because we do a few things in case study research. Number one, we write for a target audience in the classroom. We write for a target audience in the classroom. That target audience could be undergraduate, first year marketing students, or they could be master's level MBA capstone students. They could be executives on a short course, right? An open corporate, um, uh, corporate education. Uh, perhaps you're doing work with KPMG um, on your campus in your business school and you're working with a board level program at KPMG and the case is going to be teaching governance to a set of partners from KPMG in the room. Right. Um, so who we teach in the classroom is quite diverse and we need to think about that when we write a case. Right. We need to make sure that that the audience that we're writing the case for is clear and therefore the tone and the style and the content and the complexity matches the kind of audience we want to influence. Of course, we know, as Dr. Das said, that cases when we write them, include teaching notes or instructor manuals. And this is a critical second document that's part of the package. And in that document, we do two very important things we're going to talk about this evening. The one is we do a teaching plan. So we make it very clear to an instructor how they can go about facilitating learning. I like using that phrase instead of teaching, right? Because it's focus on what are we actually trying to achieve. We're trying to facilitate learning. Teaching sometimes is standing up and talking, right? And I may be influencing you here this evening and you may be learning something, but we know that true learning is much more about involvement. When you're typing in the chat, when you're making notes to yourself, when you're looking at, at this recording in a week's time, when you change how you go about doing case studies, that's when learning really happens, right? Uh, and, and so it's really important that we focus on how do we facilitate learning. That's what an instructor manual or a teaching note lays out. But the second thing that a teaching note lays out is a theoretical application or a theoretical exploration of the phenomenon. 
and the way in which theories explain or could be extended to explain the phenomenon that we're studying. So in our teaching note, we are talking also to academics. We are talking to instructors and we're putting those different parts of our lives together through the case, through the teaching note. So that's the argument I want to kick off with uh, this evening, thinking about why focus a case. We've touched on a number of aspects of what is a quality discussion case, but I hope these three points on the slide uh, summarize for you the key focus uh, we want to have here. Number one is it is about an open and unsolved dilemma or decision in the case. A quality discussion-based case, right? The eight pages of a narrative case the case that students or executives get in the classroom does not tell the whole story, does not include the solution of what a company did or what an entrepreneur or a family owner of a business, what they did, what they ended up doing. It is an unsolved open dilemma. In a way, it's the first half of a great movie. I think about the, the most uh, engaging, compelling film or book or movie that you've recently watched or consumed, right? And you don't get to the end. You don't get to find out exactly what happened, right? You leave it up to your imagination. That's what a great case is. In eight pages, we set the scene. We articulate a dilemma. We put the students in the shoes of the decision maker we give them sometimes incomplete information, but enough information in order to do some analysis, to have a management debate and to propose potential solutions. That's what the case is. I have seen some cases submitted to EMCS in the last few days where the authors go too far in the storytelling. They're telling the outcome of the story in the case. We don't do that in a case. The purpose of the case is to be a prompt for a management conversation, a management debate in the classroom. We do not put the answer in the case. We put it in the teaching note. So the instructor knows what happened, right? But of course, the process of learning through a case is thinking about what you would do as a student. It almost doesn't matter what the company landed up doing in the end. That's what they chose to do at that time. And that's interesting to reflect on. But much more important is the process of analysis and thinking and debate and proposals and conclusions and synthesizing. That's way more important to learning for the students than knowing what the company actually decided to do. So as you can see in the top left of your slide, it's about choices and options, critical to have in a case, right? The importance and seriousness of that dilemma. Why is that decision important to the decision maker at that time? How serious is it, right? Is this a strategic issue? Is this a bank the business kind of or bet the business kind of issue? Is there some urgency? Is there a timeline involved? You want to be really clear when you write a case. Remember, you're writing it in the past tense. You're writing about something that has happened already. Okay, because you're looking back, you're telling a story of this protagonist in this company at this time facing this issue. Right. Uh, and you want to be really clear about the dates and timelines involved. Okay, so that's the top left, a really critical component. And, and it's one of the first things I look for uh, when cases are submitted or draft cases or submissions. Does it have a clear dilemma, right? Is there a decision that needs to be made in this case? We know from research of learning, we know from research of case teaching that that's what engages students, right? It's a puzzle that needs to be put together. It is a dilemma that needs to be solved. Uh, students like to get to grips with something, debate with their colleagues, uh, and find an interesting solution and propose their solution, 
right? They want to be the ones in the classroom uh, who come up with the smartest answer or the smartest solution. On the right hand side of the slide, you'll see that the second critical component here is the protagonist, the character, the people. Stories are about people. We are human beings, right? Most of us. <laughs> and so as human beings, all of us, as human beings, it is the human stories that we connect with, right? Uh, the great storytellers of old knew this craft and we need to embrace the craft of storytelling. And we do that through talking about people. Who are the people involved in this case? Who are the people having to make this decision? What's their background? What's their context? What do they believe in? How do they approach their decision making? How are they feeling about some of these issues that they're having to these some of these issues they're having to deal with? We want to hear the voice of the protagonist, right? We want to see quotations. We want to hear the voice, not a sanitized voice, a real voice, right? We want quotations to be real. We want descriptions, colorful, textured descriptions of people. Um, and that often requires primary data. So now as we start to talk about uh, method and how we go about doing cases, the best cases uh, are often ones where we get inside information and we get words and we get the voice and the quotations of the characters involved and we're able to weave that into the story. Yes, we can do really good cases with secondary source data, but many times those great secondary source cases still have the voice of the protagonist. It just comes from a different place, right? Great secondary source cases use the voice of the protagonist through quotations in other places where the protagonist has given interviews to the newspaper, to TV, um, put things on social media, had a congressional hearing or some kind of legislative hearing and had to testify about issues. We can then get the protagonist's words and we can bring the voice into the case. So whether it's a, a primary source case with interviews or whether it's a secondary source case, the voice of the protagonist is really, really important because that's what we as human beings like to connect with. We want to identify, we want to see ourselves or compare ourselves to the human beings uh, that we're thinking about. All right. The third issue on the slide you can see there around quality discussion based cases, the ones we look for uh, at EMCS, Emerging Market Case Studies Collection, is recent emerging market organizational settings, right? We're looking for interesting entrepreneurial, organizational, company, business kinds of issues in an emerging market, right? Uh, and of course, being located in India or in the subcontinent or in Malaysia or in Vietnam or in Mexico or in South Africa or wherever, we are living in emerging markets around us. We know some of the institutional constraints. We know some of the hurdles that entrepreneurs need to overcome. We also know the wonderful opportunities that there are, right? Opportunities to jump other markets around the world because of technology, because of a deep understanding of consumer behavior. We know the large consumer markets that exist and the really interesting business markets that are emerging. We know the importance of government. We know the importance of the public sector in how our economies operate. Uh, and so those are many of the interesting market contexts that we're looking for. Any business, any decision happens within an economic market context. One of my mentors in South Africa, Nick Benadel, some of you may know, uh, he often says that a company doesn't exist without a country. And what he's arguing in a comment like that is that all these decisions happen within a broader context. So when you write a case, uh, I, I saw a comment here in the chat about Tata Nano, right? And Ratan Tata and the Tata and Sons uh, Automotive Group. When you're writing a case about one of the really interesting products and, and innovations and, 
and, and, and great work that's come out of Tata over decades, right? Um, is it centuries now? I suspect it might be a, a century or more. Um, the context of, of India, the, the important understanding of Tata and Sons within the Indian industrialization and economic system is obviously part of that. For anyone considering as a prospective consumer, thinking about buying into the Tata name, we know that it's more than just automotives. We know that it's more than just the current product. So understanding that broader context is important because if you're trying to teach that Tata Nano case to one of my students here in California at the University of San Francisco, they may not have heard of Ratan Tata, bless their hearts. They may never have heard of Tata and Sons. So if you're writing a case and you're focusing just on the business, just on the product, you're missing out on the broader context that could influence consumer behavior, influence competitive behavior, influence some of the decision making. Let's talk about hierarchies in a typical Indian company. Let's talk about the power of family. Uh, let's talk about religion and spirituality within some decision making. And so we want to make sure that the context that we operate in comes through in the case so that students anywhere in the world can have a clearer idea of how those decisions might be made. Okay. So those are the three points that I want us to keep in mind as we think about building these discussion-based cases. A quick question here about the differences between a case study, a case story, and a case scenario. Well, it depends on different publishers and what kind of products are being put out there by publishers, by academics, by writers um, in different places in the world. The, the typical phrase that we use, um, is it Dr. Pereira or Mr. and Mrs. Pereira? Um, the typical phrase we use is a case study. A case story would typically be part of the case study. It would be the narrative, the eight or so pages of the case study product, right, of the document. Case scenario um, might be a shorter kind of case. We talk about brief or compact cases. Uh, in, in the literature, we also talk about um, critical incidents. And, and writing more two or three page critical incidents. And that might be what a case scenario is uh, referred to, is branded by, by some uh, who publish that kind of thing. Typically, when we're thinking about this, it's a case study and it's round about eight pages of the case study. Um, and, and that's the typical uh, approach. All right. As I mentioned, we're talking about discussion-based cases and EMCS is one of those um, you know, large scale quality uh, publishers of, of, of cases. Um, we publish over 100, 120 cases a year uh, focused on emerging markets across a range of topics. And so we're getting hundreds and hundreds of submissions all the time from really interesting authors um, in the subcontinent and beyond. Um, and, and so very interested to continue to receive that from you and your colleagues as we move forward. Yes, in social entrepreneurship and in a range of other topics. We have actually a, um, we ran a competition um, with um, a university in Europe as well as some um, academics in Africa around social entrepreneurship. And, um, and so that was really interesting in the past. And we, uh, we, we have a number of cases that are published in this space. Do we publish mini cases? We publish shorter cases, what we call, I think, brief cases. So brief or compact or short cases. And they're typically three or four pages of the case narrative. The teaching note might be as long, if not longer, um, in order to really think about how we teach that. Uh, and so that is something that we do welcome. Does this mean that writing a case? Let's see a question here from Brinda Rawal. Um, in a case, taking a startup would not interest a larger audience. Um, so, Verinda, I would say the interest to the audience is about where this would fit into a classroom situation. So, think about the course, think about the level, think about um, you know what kind of topic would be taught in a classroom situation. That's where you want to think about focusing the issues 
in the case and make sure that the decisions are ones that people would be interested in exploring. A couple of quick other questions here before I move on. Um, video case is really interesting question by Rithik. Um, I think um, multimedia cases are great. Um, the challenge is how to publish them, um, especially publish them where the multimedia content is not owned by someone else. And so if you're gathering that multimedia content yourself, that's great. And we're very keen to talk to you about how we might be able to publish that behind some firewall somewhere uh, within the system. If you're just using YouTube videos, our friends at Google, if you're just using YouTube videos in your teaching note, uh, that's fine. Um, but obviously there's a limit to that because we don't own that content, right? We're borrowing that YouTube video for the purposes of teaching. So I love multimedia cases. We wanna think a little bit about how do we do that smartly. Um, Anuja, I'm not sure exactly how many words the briefcase is. Maybe Melissa can update us in a couple of moments. Um, but I typically think about three or four pages. Um, all right, I'm gonna do one or two more questions here before we jump in. Um, right, uh, disguising data. So uh, Damini Gera, Gera, Gera is asking a question here about data. Data is great, we want students to get to grips with the data, uh, but you may need to disguise that data and that's totally fine. Uh, so we, we welcome disguised data, right? Where you take some numbers, you use some kind of index and you change all the numbers, making sure that the ratios are still similar between the key numbers. Uh, fictional data, we don't publish. So you don't wanna create characters that don't exist. You don't wanna create numbers that don't exist. Uh, so we don't do fiction, uh, but we do do disguised data. So I hope that helps. All right, case studies, engineering studies. If those engineering studies talk about management decision-making, um, then Dilip, yes, uh, that sounds good. Uh, and a synopsis, synopsis is a specific part of the teaching note that we'll talk about uh, that sits in the teaching note component. All right, I'm gonna jump into the rest of the slides here and, and kind of touch on some of the aspects uh, as we go through. Um, what an EMCS, what a quality discussion-based case is not, is an article case. So remember I said that part of the portfolio of work that we do is we publish in a bunch of places. We publish a bunch of kinds of things for different audiences. And if I'm writing in the Journal of Marketing, Right. I'm going to write in a certain way. I'm going to write for a different audience, an audience of academics. And that's going to be an article. Now, I could use case study methodology to write that article. Right? But I'm going to put the answer in the article. I'm going to write a complete story with the analysis. It's kind of like the case and the answer and the analysis from the teaching note all in one thing. That's an article case. That's great, that's an important contribution. That's not a discussion-based case. That's not what we publish. So keep it clear, right? The kinds of products, the kinds of output that we write. And then important, PR pieces. Yes, the organization signs off that we use their quotations correctly, that we included the data they gave us correctly, but uh, we don't write what the company wants us to write. We are researchers first. We write objectively researched, well-researched cases. And so we don't just write what they want to, they, they tell us. We don't just write what, uh, what they want us to write. So it's not a PR piece, right? It's not something the company would write themselves. If they want to tell their story in the way they want to tell their story, that's great. That's for them a academic, well-researched, discussion-based case study for use in the classroom to facilitate learning through discussion. The reason it's called a discussion-based case is because it comes out of this tradition mainly associated with Harvard where we learn through discussion, right? We learn through the debate in the room. We don't learn through just reading. We don't learn through just listening. We learn through the conversation and having our ideas challenged by others, 
by doing preparation and proposing things and having it beaten down by other smart people in the room. Through that discussion, what Harvard calls participant-centered learning, discussion-based learning. That's what a discussion-based case is for, right? Uh, some refer to it as a teaching case as well, uh, but that includes a whole bunch of other kinds of things as well. So discussion-based cases is typically what we refer to. All right, um, conscious of time. So I'm gonna jump through a few other aspects here around what is a case and how to focus on it. I've spoken about style, and you can see here in this quick example, on the left, I'm writing, this is my work from before, I'm writing to other academics, and I'm writing here an academic article, and I'm publishing it in a journal that publishes articles. On the right, I'm writing for managers, I'm writing for students, and so my style is different. The case study style of writing is different. I'm in a storytelling mode, right? I'm almost journalistic in some respects, right? And so you can see that style is different. Think about the L'Oreal Russia case that we sent you. If you had a chance to read that L'Oreal Russia case as an example of a kind of case you want to think about, not perfect in any respect, but something to think about. And we have other sample cases that you may want to look at. And I encourage you, as you think about writing great cases, you want to be reading and using great cases. That's really what inspires our work. You can see that there's a different style here, and that's really important. Case study and teaching note. I've mentioned that there's two different documents, right? Case study signed off by the organization. Uh, or extensively sourced with secondary sources. It's what students get, it's what they read, it's got the dilemma, it's got the character, it's about eight pages plus some exhibits and data. That's the case study, right? It does not, uh, Nasimula, uh, in your, your question, it does not have a synopsis, right? The synopsis is in the teaching note. Teaching note has a very different structure, right? A teaching note, and we have a template that you can follow kind of almost paint by numbers. <laughs> we have a template where you can go step by step, block by block and fill it in. And what you see in the teaching note is you've got a synopsis that tells a quick summary of what the case is about. You have a section on the learning outcomes, uh, the target audience for this case, the key assignment questions, the answers to those assignment questions, a teaching plan, the application of theory, the postscript, uh, board examples of how you would teach it on a whiteboard or a blackboard or whatever kind of board you're using. So a teaching note is a very different kind of document with, with a different structure. Uh, and so you want to keep that in mind as you write these two things. And we have all of those resources and templates available. Last few comments I want to make here before I hand over to Melissa to share some of those resources with you is how to do a case study. So a few thoughts here. Uh, one is about how to get going. So some of you may have less experience writing cases and be thinking about where do I start? How do I kind of get an idea? Well, there's two key places that most case authors start. The one is thinking about what they want to teach. And for many of us, our day jobs is, te are te is teaching, right? And so you're teaching a course, you have a syllabus, a course outline, you may have a gap. You may have something you want to teach where you do not have a useful learning tool, material, resource, uh, and so you want to, to find something. And you can jump onto Emerald Insight and look at EMCS cases. You can look in other places for quality cases that you could use, or perhaps you recognize that perhaps there's an opportunity for you to write the case that you're going to teach in that section of your course. So that's the one place to start. And, and for many of us, we write cases in order to teach in a specific section of our course. That's great. It's a good starting point. The second starting point or an alternate starting point could be an interesting story. So you jump onto your social media feed and you see something interesting about Mahindra or Tata and Sons or Infosys or Reliance or whoever and you see an interesting story that you think needs to be told and a story that you think students can learn something from. That's the key thing. Is it an interesting story that will engage and that they'll learn more about 
financial management, that they'll learn something more about startup economics, that they'll learn something more about um, people management or marketing strategy. So are there interesting stories? Stories also come from alumni. And I think it's critical that us, that we as business school faculty, as Dr. Das says, if we're in a business school, we're thinking about cases, we're thinking about the kind of impact we're having, let's engage with our alumni. We have so many wonderful alumni doing really interesting work. Are we talking to them every week about what they're doing? And is that surfacing some interesting case stories? Uh, I think that's a real challenge for us to get out of the office get off campus, go and talk to our alumni, go and build relationships with those students who have come before. Uh, and I think that raises some really interesting examples that we can develop into cases. So those are two places that you may want to start as you think about this. Data gathering, I've spoken about sources and thinking about, uh, you know, how do we go about gathering uh, information. Um, some steps here. I think I've spoken about some of these. You want to do some desk research, some interviews. Uh, you draft the dilemma. You think about writing the sections. Remember that as you write the case study and the teaching note, these are two documents, part of a bundle or a package. It's an iterative process. And so you're going to work in one and then work in the other and then go back and forth and make sure that they are connected and aligned very strongly. Right? You do not want to have a situation where you or another instructor is trying to teach a case and there's something in the teaching note um, that's not in the case, right? Or there's data in the case that's not analyzed properly in the teaching note. You want to make sure that they're totally aligned. So keep that in mind as you think about going through the process. I mentioned that the teaching note was quite structured. Here you can see the main sections of a teaching note and we have all those resources available uh, that Melissa is going to touch on. Last few thoughts here <clears throat> yeah, from a teaching note point of view is around learning. Uh, learning outcomes are critical. Remember that we're right a discussion-based case and we spent a lot of time today talking about the story and what the story does and how we write a compelling story. But remember that it is about the facilitation of learning. Many of us in our doctoral studies, many of us in our education have not really learned how to facilitate learning. And I think it's a deficiency in far too many doctoral programs around the world. We, we become experts at a topic and then we go and get a job where most of that job is teaching but we may not have spent enough time thinking about how do we teach well? How do we facilitate learning well? And so I think an important aspect of the teaching note is to spend time thinking about learning theory. Bloom's taxonomy, for example, thinking about learning outcomes, uh, understanding group work, understanding this participant-centered, discussion-based kind of approach, listening, asking questions. There's an entire body of knowledge about how to ask great questions in the room, how questions can facilitate great learning versus average questions that don't do so well. These are things that I think we can all be honest and say we don't really get in many of our doctoral programs. It's important that we look at that in order to write the teaching note. We want to equip an instructor anywhere in the world to be able to pick up your case and effectively facilitate learning. So we need to make sure that our learning structure, our teaching plan, our group work, our role plays, our discussion questions uh, are quality and are focused on uh, facilitating learning. Here's an example on the screen of uh, learning outcomes of um, Bloom's taxonomy, thinking about the knowledge and the cognitive process dimension. It's important to remember here is we're focusing on the, on the verbs, on the doing words, right? At the end of this case session, what will students be able to do? 
The objective of any learning is change. The objective of any learning session, any class session, is that students will be able to walk out and do something different. How do we facilitate that through our case teaching? That's an important component, component of the teaching note. All right, some final reminders here as I wrap up my comments and we go to some questions and Melissa, etc. cetera. Um, remember the opening paragraph is critical. Those first three or four minutes of a James Bond movie, those first three or four minutes are, or first three or four pages of a book are critical to pull in the reader. Uh, so you want to introduce the character, you want to make the dilemma clear, you want to be clear to the reader where and when in the world you are. So I can see just from the first five or six lines of a case, whether the author has the writing style to grab and engage the reader. That opening paragraph is one I would encourage you to spend a lot of time on. The narrative we said, most of the case, past tense throughout, no present tense. India was a country. Not India is a country. India was a country. And I'm not going to suggest for a second that India is not going to be a country. But if we're writing a case of 2022 and I'm teaching it in 2024, I have no idea if the current reality will be the same. And so I'm always writing in the past tense, right? Tata and Sons was a company that. Sourcing. Make sure that you have extensive sourcing, good references. Uh, obviously, primary data is great. If you don't have access to primary data or interviews, secondary sources is, is excellent. Even if you use interviews, secondary sources are a very important backup to that. Uh, storytelling flow. We've spoken about telling a great story, thinking about how the story develops, and then the dilemma. What's the decision? Right? What's the decision that the protagonist is trying to make? That needs to be core through the entire case. Writing is critical. And so it's important that you develop the craft, the skill to write effectively, write clearly, write succinctly, write correctly. So certainly proper first language English editing is important. If that's a struggle for you, work with colleagues, get some editing support. Um, it's so unfortunate where we get great cases that can facilitate some fabulous learning, but there are grammar errors, there are sentence structure errors. Um, the, the authors have just not been able to craft the communication of the case. Most of our lives as academics, we are communicating. We need to constantly sharpen the saw, get better and better, refine our ability to communicate. All right. So let me pause at that point uh, as we head to about an hour here in our session. Uh, why do a case? What is a case? How to do a case? I hope these three topics for discussion have been useful. I'm going to pause there. I'm going to look at some of these questions and I'm going to hand over back uh, to Ashutosh and I think Melissa uh, for some additional comments. Thank you, Professor Michael. So I would like to request Ms. Melissa Knoll. I will share Please my screen. Yes, you, you can share. Thank you. So Melissa Knoll will uh, explain more about publishing with EMCS. Over to you, Ms. Melissa. Okay, I'm just selecting the PowerPoint. not in present mode. Now it is in present mode. Uh, okay, thumbs up, we can see it. Um, so I'm just going to hop right in, being conscious of time. But to give a quick refresh of who I am, um, I am the cases publisher at Emerald. Um, so if you have any questions about the publishing process or Emerald in particular, feel free to pop those in the chat um, and I'll take a look at those and get you an answer. Um, and I'm based in Boston in the US. 
So just to tell you a bit more about the Emerging Markets Case Studies Collection, if you're considering submitting to us, um, EMCS publishes discussion-based teaching case studies, as we mentioned, um, and our goal is to have those cases offer students the opportunity to explore real world challenges in the classroom environment. Uh, the real world kind of phrase there is very important because um, we do not accept fi fictional cases. Um, it has to be kind of a challenge or business dilemma that has taken place in an actual um, real world environment. Um, and ultimately, we want these cases to allow students to test their decision making skills before taking their knowledge into the workplace. Um, when compared to other case study collections, um, EMCS is unique uh, because it specializes specifically in case studies and you know case research about emerging markets and economies, um, regions which are typically a bit underrepresented in the literature, but which no doubt offer unique and valuable insights um, for for dynamic classroom discussions. Um, in terms of what we uh, accept as a publication, uh, we accept cases from all business and management disciplines. Um, all cases that we publish do have to include those teaching notes um, that Michael mentioned. Um, we do have some resources for that, which I will link on the next slide. Um, we are also open to submissions year round with no submission fees. Um, so whenever you're ready, you can send in a case. Um, with no kind of barriers there. And we do also host numerous competitions and special issues each year as well, which I will also highlight in the next slide, just to give you an idea of come, some exciting opportunities coming up. Um, some other things I would highlight on this slide um, is just because there is a question around compact or short cases. Previously, um, we typically encourage compact cases to be about a thousand words. Um, the teaching note portion can be much longer, as Professor Goldman mentioned. Um, but you don't, we do compact cases and regular case studies as well. So if you can't quite fit it into a thousand words, it's okay. Um, and I have listed my contact information up on this slide in case you want to reach out to me after this presentation for any reason. Um, feel free to send me an email um, if you have questions about submitting or if you're interested in getting involved as a reviewer. Um, or uh, seeing the rest of the collection as well. Oh, so to dive into some specific resources, uh, the main resource I wanted to flag was the Cases Learning Hub. Uh, so the Cases Hub is a completely free online resource um, that anyone can register for, which is developed by case experts to help case writers get published and write their cases. Um, so when you register for an account on the Hub, you gain access to a very interactive and informative, um, essentially a course on how to write a case that will take you through the entire process from identifying that need to evaluating your case study and then getting published. Um, as you go through, you'll find a bunch of different modules where we have videos from our collection editors, um, helpful infographics, kind of uh, checklists of things you should be looking for as you're writing your case and you know questions to consider to make sure that you're having like a well-rounded approach to your narrative um, which can be really helpful particularly if you are new to the case method um, to have this guide to follow as you go along um, so I do recommend that you sign up for the Cases Hub. Um, and in addition to the main core writing module, um, the Hub does also have a number of other resources as well. Um, so we have a module on teaching with case studies. If professors want to you know, make use of more case studies in their classroom, and they just want to get some more practice with the method uh, so that they can facilitate better questions or potentially, you know, how do we use case studies in a virtual learning environment, stuff like that. Um, we also have a learning with case studies module. Um, this can actually be assigned in your classrooms along with any case that you're having your students read. Um, so you can have, have them do this with their homework, essentially. Um, and as they're reading that case, there will be places for them to note down, you know, the relevant details and just make sure that they're doing that thorough preparation um, that helps them come to class prepared and understand, you know, what this case is trying to accomplish and leave um, having a good dynamic discussion. Um, and then finally, we have a useful resourceful, useful resources section um, that has previous webinars we've conducted. Um, it has some guides and 
I think most helpfully some sample cases, which are, I think, very instructive to show you um, a good model for what a case looks like. There's some of our um, award-winning cases on there that just shows you and gives you something to measure in your own case against. Um, some additional resources I wanted to link. Um, since these slides will be shared around after this presentation, so you can use these links to go directly to these resources. Um, first is that link to the hub, and then we also have that guide to writing teaching cases, um, which jots down pretty much everything you need to cover, very helpful. Um, and similarly, a guide to writing a teaching note, which you can kind of methodically go through and make sure that you're covering all of the sections that we expect as a collection. And I've also listed the EMCS author guidelines on this slide. Um, I do highly recommend anyone looking to submit to EMCS reads the author guidelines in full, um, just to make sure that you don't get, you know, sent back for some technicality or something you've missed that was in our author guidelines. Um, it does speed up the process quite a bit when people are very thorough and making sure that they've covered all the correct um, expectations there. Um, and that is on our website and also contains links to these other resources if you lose this um, PowerPoint at any time. Um, and just to wrap my section up, we do have some upcoming opportunities that I wanted to flag. Um, as I mentioned, we run a number of special issues on hot topics throughout the year, um, quite a few with upcoming deadlines. Um, so I've listed them all out by title um, with their associated deadline on this slide. Um, the first is digital entrepreneurship in India. Um, we have another on informal business, business practices in emerging markets, um, innovation, entrepreneurship, and business sustainability in emerging markets, uh, construction, real estate, infrastructure, and project management, and innovative startups in emerging markets. Um, so quite a big spread of topics. Um, we do also accept proposals for other special issues. If that is something you're interested in, um, please do feel free to reach out to me. Um, and you can be and you can view all of these special issues calls for cases um, on our website through that link um, as long as you kind of know where the emcs homepage is you'll be able to navigate to anything else i promise um, we also do run a number of case writing competitions so if that's something you're interested in exploring just kind of bookmark that link at the bottom of the slide and check back throughout the year as we add new ones to our lineup and that was a real whistle stop tour for me. Um, but I think I've seen a lot of chat going on. Um, so I'll stop sharing and we can go to discussion. So we can have a question answer now. All the, I request all the participants to ask specific question related to the case writing, whatever learnings you had in this one hour, 15 minutes. You can have a good all right, Ashutosh, shall I jump in here? I see a few questions that I haven't answered yes. yet. And, and I agree, if there are ones that I missed over the last uh, hour and a bit, uh, please pop them in again and let's try and do that in a quick fire seven minute round. Uh, let's look here, I see Diraj's question. Uh, hypothetical cases. So the challenge here, Diraj, is we are academics researching real phenomenon. And, and so we want to facilitate learning around real situations. Uh, we know from research that students are much more engaged in real situations as opposed to hip hypothetical situations. Um, and, and so we think there's so much value in learning from what is actually happening. Uh, so that's why um, no one really publishes hypothetical or fictional cases. Um, certainly in the academic publishing space or in the case research space, uh, everything is based on real data, whether primary or secondary. Um, but yes, Darash, uh, secondary source cases, as I mentioned, are welcomed and many of the best selling, the best used cases um, are secondary source cases where the authors have been able to track down the voice of the protagonist and got some really good inside information. Looking at media articles may not be enough, right? And so when I talk about secondary source cases, I'm talking about dozens and dozens of sources. I'm talking about industry reports. I'm talking about analyst reports. I'm talking about um, 
you know, uh, company documents, perhaps, uh, obviously annual reports and media reports. I'm talking about social media posts. Uh, I'm talking about obviously some of that legislative stuff. Uh, and so, so yeah, it, it's that kind of sourcing. Um, why EMCS versus some of those others? And, and I've certainly published in a bunch of places and I work with many of the publishers and many of my colleagues do. Um, as my resume says, I'm a previous uh, president of the North American Case Research Association, which is the Case Research Journal, which uh, distributes as well through Harvard Business School Publishing. So I, I think I understand a little bit of the space. What I think EMCS provides that's quite unique is a few things. One is it's got a very clear emerging market focus and we are emerging market friendly, right? So we're actively looking for emerging market stories and we work with authors from emerging markets to refine and to package the story to make it most appealing uh, around the world. So I think that's a critical component. Secondly is Scopus and being a, a, a collection that is accredited and seen as an academic publication. Our friends at Ivy and our friends at Harvard are not. They are clearing houses, they are distributors and publishers that are not accredited. They're not on Scopus. Um, and although I know many deans um, still consider a case published through our friends at Ivy or our friends at Harvard as counting, that's great. Many science systems in the world do not. Uh, and, and so again, you need to think about your institution, uh, your dean, your accreditation body, your tenure and promotion committees, and your science system in your country. Uh, and certainly Emerald has made the investment uh, to make sure that we are Scopus ranked and that we follow those academic principles. So I think that's the second component. And then the third is the reach. Uh, and certainly Emerald Insight is globally used um, and subscribed in many of the libraries in our institutions. Um, and we are getting over 80, 85,000 downloads a year of our over five, 600 cases in the collection. Uh, and so that reach in terms of impact, I think is appealing. Uh, for many uh, academics. So, um, Diraj, that was my 30 second pitch on EMCS. I hope that's helpful for, for you to think about it. Let me see one or two more here. Um, special issues, uh, Mokales, yes. Uh, great, great uh, reminder to everyone. We have those great special issues that Melissa mentioned. So please dive into that. It's a great way of publishing cases with others who are publishing cases in the same space. Plagiarism. So, Saeed, great question here. Melissa and the team at Emerald uh, take a look at that similarity score uh, when you submit. Uh, and, and although you may be quoting data from elsewhere, you may be using secondary sources from elsewhere. In your teaching note, you may be summarizing or paraphrasing theory. So those are the areas that often jump up in terms of similarity score. We typically have a very low percentage that we see um, for submitted cases. So if you're getting, I mean, my rule of thumb is if you're getting more than about 10 or 15% similarity score at our friends on Turnitin or any of those platforms, um, I'd go back and check my document uh, and make sure I haven't copied and pasted or paraphrased in a way that's inappropriate. Uh, let's just race through a few other questions here. Uh, hypothetical data simile, Subam, no, no hypothetical data, no fictional data, you can disguise, right? So disguising is a great way of telling the story with real data and then protecting some of the information that companies may not want to share. So if they don't want their net earnings number to be known, you can disguise that net earnings number. You can index it by five up or five down, or you can change it to a previous year, but it must be based on real data. Um, upcoming opportunities, Priyanka, those are also on our website. So the, the details that Melissa shared of upcoming opportunities and special issues um, is on our website. Perhaps uh, Melissa can post that if she hasn't yet. Um, the URL uh, for that. Is a discussion case study, what would be the research methodology? So Dr. Kasrui, sorry, um, it's case research methodology. 
and case research methodology. Robert Yin wrote a great book on case research methodology and many of my case study uh, colleagues have written other books and I recently wrote a chapter around teaching notes. The method here is a scientific rigorous method of going out and looking at multiple kinds of sources and multiple kinds of data in order to tell a complete story. Uh, dive into that and, and see what you can see. Uh, let's see, is there anyone else? Timeline. Um, so we will get back to authors within 90 days, typically around 60 days of submission with some kind of editorial feedback. Um, the, the case gets submitted, our editorial office and team takes a look if there are any issues, as Melissa said, where you, the authors have not met our author guidelines, we pop it back for some quick changes. Then if it goes for peer review, it's between 60 to 90 days feedback um, from double blind peer review, typical uh, journal process. Uh, and then of course it sits with the authors and we encourage authors to turn it around within a couple of months or so, get it back to us. Uh, and, and so the time it takes, Professor COVID, uh, K-O-V-I-D as opposed to C-O-V-I-D, uh, I suspect you've heard that joke far too many times in the last three years. Um, I, the, the total time it takes is dependent often on the author and how quickly they're able to turn it back. Um, most of our submitted cases have uh, two or three rounds of review uh, in order to get the case as better, as better, as better as possible. Uh, and so that certainly can take, um, you know, six to nine to 12 months uh, in terms of the 60 days and then back to the author and then 60 to 90 days and then back to the author. Obviously later rounds uh, typically take less time. Um, I'm conscious of time. Ashutosh, do we have a few more minutes for these questions or should we bring it to a close? We have five minutes. For All two. right, cool. I'm good with that. Let's see. Um, thanks, Melissa, for answering that question. Newspapers, yes, are a good source. Uh, or Anurag, are you joking that you don't know what a newspaper is? Uh, Anurag, you're going to have to put your age in the chat so we can see whether you know what a newspaper is. Uh, newspapers were around when I was still a kid, so there you go. Um, is If there's no change. Um, so, Hirarani, uh, the question here around change. Uh, when I talk about change, students can change the way of thinking. Students can change their perspective, which leads to a change of behavior. Uh, we want students to be able to use different tools and use them in different ways and use them in a better way. So this is a bigger question that we don't have time for, um, but I would challenge the idea of no change. Um, all learning must facilitate some kind of change. If you walk away here from the 75 minutes and nothing has changed for you in your perspective, in your style, in your craft, um, then I would argue we've missed out on the opportunity to facilitate learning. So that's a bigger conversation we need to engage in. Uh, teaching note is compulsory, absolutely. Um, it, it goes without saying. Um, review board clearance, um, we don't require those to Ranga data, we don't require um, that it is submitted. What we do require is a consent form if there's primary data. Uh, but certainly it is a responsibility of all ethical researchers to get the review board clearance if required by your institution, depending on the kind of data that you're gathering. A lot of the secondary source cases that I have written in the past have not required review board clearance from my institutions because I'm not talking to human beings and I'm not having a direct impact in the research process on human beings. All right, I'm just gonna scan through here if there's any others. Um, the structure for writing cases, the structure for most cases is the same, whether it's academic or educational, the, the, the structure is the same, right? We're telling a story, eight pages, we're kicking off with the dilemma, we're telling a bit of the, the, the history and context, we're diving into the choices and options, we're ending off with the dilemma. So that structure, that style uh, is fairly standard. Um, all right. Uh, let me do one more. Ding, 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 ding. Scanning through here. Um, 
Rajendra Sharma, I'm, I'm glad you did that program through Harvard. It's excellent. Uh, many great resources, and I look forward to seeing your sales and marketing cases being submitted. Uh, all right, last question here from Juan Ernesto Perez. Uh, buenos dias, Juan. Does the journal receive cases written in Spanish or do they all have to be English? Our default submission is English, Juan. Uh, we do not publish Spanish or other language other than English language cases on an ongoing basis. We have done a special issue working with our Spanish language reviewers and, and editors. Um, and I encourage Melissa to continue to do that every so often. Um, please keep in touch with us, Juan, uh, and keep a lookout on special issues in other languages. At the moment, all the default submissions are in English. So with that, uh, I hope we've addressed many of your questions. Ashutosh, well done. I think everyone should give a round of applause um, for this amazing session that he was able put to put, put together in such short space of time. Uh, I've really enjoyed being part of this, so let me hand back to you, and I look forward to many great cases being written and submitted over the coming weeks and months. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Michael. It was an honor of us to have with you. And uh, as the day is coming to the end, and this session was useful for all of us, uh, so we have with us, we have with us Mr. Sundar Radhakrishnan, Managing Director, Amrind India. Thank you, sir, for joining us. Absolutely, so, my pleasure. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm sorry, I was not able to switch on my camera and speak. I'm holding it on a phone. But uh, uh, such a pleasure uh, joining all of you today. Thanks a lot. Thank you, thank you. So uh, I would like to give the vote of thanks. A case study shares past experiences and gives the right direction to future management. Yes, it's an integral part of the curriculum for management students and further provides the scope of an industry academy partnership. I want to extend my heartfelt thanks to Professor Michael M. Goldman for explaining the details of case writing. I sincerely thank Mr. Sundar Radhakrishnan for this wonderful collaboration between Four and Amrul India. My thanks to Ms. Sangeetha and Ms. Melissa Rose, without whom this webinar could ha have not been possible. Also, I sincerely thank Ms. Lisa from Amrul India for the webinar promotion. I sincerely thank Dr. Jitendra K. Das for giving us this opportunity of collaborative webinar with Four and Amrul India. My sincere thanks to Professor Himanshu Joshi, Professor Rajni Chauhan, Professor Sangmitra for their support. My sincere thanks to all the participants to make this webinar successful. Last but not the least, my sincere thanks to our backing team, Mr. Rakitosh, Mr. Uday, Mr. Sadanand, Mr. Anuj, and Mr. Neeraj for coordinating the activity successfully. Thanks a lot, all of you. I hope you enjoyed this learning, and we'll soon meet with another case webinar and a research webinar with Cameron India. Thank you all.